that faith is that wherever two or more are gathered, the Lord is there, the Spirit is present, then maybe this notion of preparing to pray. So let's get ready. You know, we exercise, we do physical exercise, and we prepare. Like, hey, we're going to go out and do a 100-meter dash or a marathon, but we, you warm up. So right now, you know, we're, we're warming up. We're, we're thinking like, wow, we're about to turn our view, look at, think about, commune with the king of kings, the creator of the universe. So this notion of let's prepare to pray, it kind of makes sense. Then just jumping like, let's pray. Like, wait a minute, I didn't even warm up. You know, the gun goes off. So as, you're, as, you, as we're preparing to pray, I think it's a good warning. <laughs> and if we really believe what we confess, that we're about to talk to God or ask God something, then we kind of get ready. What does it look like? I mean, if we're, if we're ready to run the 100-meter dash, it kind of looks like this. Or you're down, actually. If you're ready to run a marathon, it's more like this. But you can tell that people are ready to go or start. So if we prepare to pray, get in your prayer posture. We're about to talk to God. Just a nice little reminder for all of us. And I was trying to buy to Anna some more time. So she'll enter in. I don't know if anyone else is working this device for Anna. Oh, there we go. Good. And she can... She asked me to do it. Good. Well, then she can cut out the warm-up if she wants or... Are we, doing, are we doing Facebook Live, or are we doing, who knows? You just, you're just recording. And then she can post it as she see, sees fit. So this gave you a chance to think about that we're about to look to God. And if you're at the Newman Center, you know, obviously we have a group of believers. But as a group of athletes, everyone can be like, yeah, I, I, I want to run track. We still are always looking at ways of being better at. We're always thinking of injury prevention. What would be injury prevention from the standpoint of, of, our, of our faith life, faith exercise? I'm sure you could think of lots of analogies to injury prevention when you think about sin missing the mark and the consequences of sin. So with that, we're taking our faith seriously as now the gun's going to go off. And what does that look like in the Catholic faith? In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, amen. So we can pray together. We believe in the dignity of all human life, from conception to natural death. We run as a prayer to defend children in the womb so that they may be born and united with our Christian community. We want to build endurance, for the race is long, and we must keep our eyes fixed on you, Lord. We run for awareness, so our culture will view all human life as a reflection of your glory, Lord. We run for charity to provide support for mothers and fathers tempted to abort their child and healing support for post-abortion women, men, and families. We run to end abortion for Christ died so that all may live. Guard us all, born and unborn, with your peace, Lord. For in you, life is victorious. We pray and run in your name, Jesus Christ, amen. St. Padre Pio. Our Lady Guadalupe, pray for us. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen. So we enter in. You know, St. Paul uh, exhorts us to pray unceasingly. Like, is that possible? Yeah, I mean, if we're staying in communion with God, if everything that we do is in communion with God, certainly this is in communion with God's will, that we gather to do what? To do what that prayer just said. We gather to defend life from conception to eternity. And we're going to get focused. We're going to have some intentionality in some of our conversation. And most importantly, I want to make sure that we get to talk about what you want to talk about. Okay, so I'm going to, I'm going to create time for that. So the, for those that came to the talk, I'm not sure if you're like, hey, there's a talk going on, or hey, there's a pro-life talk, or hey, I don't know what your invite looked like, but the title of the talk is Living Pro-Life with Heroic Virtue. We're also going to give some commentary about what's going on in the pro-life movement at a national level. In particular, on Wednesday, there's going to be a Supreme Court case with op the opening arguments in Dobbs versus Jackson. And so we're going to talk about that a little bit. Like, what does that mean? Why is it significant? So, and then, as I mentioned, we'll leave some room for discussion. I'm Dr. Pat Castle, so I'm the founder of Life Runners. Life Runners began with an encounter with St. Padre Pio. 
So I hung out with St. Padre Pio for about 10 minutes at the top of, of a mountain in Colorado uh, named Pikes Peak. Anyone ever been to the bottom of Pikes Peak? I'll start with that. Who's seen Pikes Peak? All right, who's been to the top of Pikes Peak? Sure. And I'm guessing most people probably drove. Okay, did anybody hike up Pikes Peak to the top? Sorta, of, kinda, you made it part way up. Made it to the top? Hiked from the base to the top? Awesome. So, you, so I decided it'd be a good idea to race, to run from the base to the top, uh, which I did four times. And on one of those journeys, it kind of makes sense uh, that help from a friend, St. Padre Pio, came in very handy. And St. Pio said, basically one of, his, one of my favorite prayers from St. Pio is, Lord, please don't allow me in to the kingdom until I had a chance to help all my friends into the kingdom. So I think God granted him that wish. I'm not giving a talk on St. Padre Pio, but if you want to ask some questions at the end, if you want to stick around and like, hey, I want to hear about your encounter with St. Padre Pio, I'd be happy to share. But that's not the title of this talk. So that encounter was in 2006. A bunch of dominoes fell. Uh, first domino was I led a, a men's Bible study, and we studied a book called Unbound by Neil Lozano. Anyone familiar with Unbound, the book Unbound? All right, so it's a book about evil in the modern world. So it makes, it bridges the stories of evil in the Old Testament and New Testament and, and biblical evil to from the modern world. How is evil working in the world? And it really transitions nicely. It, you conclude that study and realize like, wow, evil is alive and working. And that book really helps you recognize it. So that book helped us identify what we can back up as the crown jewel of Satan, and that is abortion. How can you make such a statement to call abortion the crown jewel of Satan? Well, if we are God's greatest treasure, that he made us in his likeness, then the corollary of stealing or killing that greatest of gift, our very lives, would be the greatest evil. So that's how you can make the statement that abortion is the crown jewel of Satan. You know, I, I, I spoke to a group of eighth graders at St. Columkill in Papillion. Anyone familiar with Papillion, Nebraska? Anyone from that area? Yes, yeah, so you can picture St. Columkill. And in my opening comments, I said, we're going to talk about the evilest place on the planet in any abortion facility by definition, is the evilest place on the planet, based on what's happened there, based on the crown jewel of Satan. We're going to talk about the evilest place on the planet. So I'm in Papillion, Nebraska, and I said it's about 10 minutes from here. Does anybody know what that place is? And an eighth grade boy, serious, not a joke, said, Iowa? <laughs> so, you know, for, for, the, for the Nebraska people, you probably found that very... So I had to, like, keep my, you know keep it together, like, not Iowa, there's a place more evil than Iowa, and that's Carhartt's abortion facility in Bellevue. But in eighth grade, is it Iowa? You know, is that the evil place? No. So any abortion facility, by definition, would be the evilest place on the planet. So we gather to talk about living pro-life with heroic virtue. We gather about how can we be part doing our part, being responsible to knowing this, how can we be part of ending abortion? In this moment, in the next moment, in your hallway, in your classrooms. And that there's lots of different ways of bringing that about. Certainly the, our greatest weapon is prayer. As St. Padre Pio called the rosary, bring me my weapon. And so we know that. But we also know that prayer that there is, we, we can be a prayer. I mean, you, you, you reflected on the Life Runners Creed where we say we run as a prayer. And here comes the best news of the night. Best news of the night. Running is optional, okay? So everyone just take a collective, like, really? As a matter of fact, to even make it better, we consider the non-running Life Runners better Life Runners because it's easier to see the back of their shirt when they're walking and not running. So everyone's at ease now, right? Like, wow, I love you, Lord, and if, you, if I have to run, I'll do it for you. 
if I have to, to end abortion, so be it. And some people, they actually say that. They're like, listen, I'm not a runner, but I'm willing to run. I'm re- willing to show up. But that's optional. We do a relay across America every summer. It's the largest spanning pro-life event in the world, and it's running and walking in 5K segments. From the Golden Gate Bridge in San Francisco, the Brooklyn Bridge in New York City, moving towards Kansas City, from St. Michael the Archangel Parish in Grand Forks, North Dakota, the the, um, San Fernando Cathedral in San Antonio, moving for 40 days towards Kansas City. And after 40 days, all four of those arms converge. And every summer from the July 4th to August 8th, we do that. And people of all ages participate, and people around the world participate. Half of the miles on the course are completed off the course, geographically separated. So they do the distance. They do it during the time frame of the relay. But for example, on the island of Fiji, Fiji, would you believe there's 800 life runners, over 800 life runners, and they adopt the state of Utah. That's their thing. Their chapter leader's like, we'll take Utah. <laughs> so they take, the, they just like, there's a state. We'll just take all the five Ks across Utah. And they do that, it is. So to think of an island in the middle of the Pacific Ocean, they are participating in spirit and physically really doing it, breaking up the 5K legs and doing them on the island of Fiji. And that's happening. We have life runners in 41 nations. We have life runners in over 2,200 cities to think that they're doing it where they're at. But if you live in Nebraska, if you're close to Omaha like we are, guess what? The course goes right through Omaha on its way from North Dakota on down to Kansas City. So the Newman Center Life Runners could say, hey, let's actually go to the course as a pilgrimage. And let's go do some 5Ks. Let's get a, a van load, a few car loads of Life Runners, and let's go relay a chunk of 5Ks for a few hours. What a great idea. Or you could say, let's not do that. How about instead we roll out of our dorm or apartment or the Newman Center and we just do it right here in Lincoln? We're okay with that. Because what's the goal? The goal is to get this message out. People wearing their witness. Witness with fitness. And people see it. And does it matter? Listen to this stat. 78% of post-abortion mothers said that if one person encouraged them to choose life, or they saw an encouraging sign, they would not have aborted their child. 78% enter life runners. We're an encouraging person with an encouraging sign on our back to think that rolling through a grocery store, going to class, going across campus with a shirt that says, remember the unborn, post-abortion mother said that would have been enough to do exactly what the message says, remember the unborn, and not show up in an abortion facility. So the title of the talk again, Living Pro-Life with Heroic Virtue. Living Pro-Life with Heroic Virtue. What's heroic about putting on a shirt that says, remember the unborn? It's life-saving. I just gave you the the data. 40% of abortions happen in the demographic of a college campus, the age group of a college campus, 40% of abortions. So think about the probability, possibility, of someone really seeing your shirt that's really in a crisis pregnancy that would be really encouraged to choose life and not go to an abortion facility. So you have a very real possibility of saving a life and saving a mother the pain, the lifetime pain of an abortion and possibly saving a relationship. 90% of relationships end when an abortion enters into that relationship. How's that for a stat? If you want to break out your phone, I'm going to be giving you lots of stats, information, etc. There might be something you're like, I need to capture that. So if you want to break out your phone with a little note taker, something to type down, why? Because later, you might come up at the end of the presentation and grab a picture with your friends with the Remember the Unborn and share it in social media with a stat that you found poignant with a stat that you went, really, 90% of relationships? Yep, Bernadette and I were in front of Carhartt's abortion facility um, a year or so ago, and there was a couple that came in, and I asked them why they were there for an abortion, 
And they literally said, to save our relationship. I shared that 90% stat. She looked at him and said, what do you want to do? And he went, well, I don't want to do this if, it's, if we have a 90% chance of our relationship ending. And she said, okay, let's go. Just that stat. Just being able to speak truth, the reality of abortion. And you can see all these stats. If you got your smartphone, you want to kind of follow along. If you grab a smartphone out and you go to liferunners.org slash stats. So maybe you want to go there and take a peek while you're you know, looking at that. When it comes to question time, you might see another stat on there like, hey, oh my goodness. 40% of minors who have an abortion, 40% of those abortions, the parents don't know about the abortion. How can that be? You might look at it and go, really? One in three American women in their childbearing ages have had an abortion? R really? You might look at it and go, really? One in five pregnancies in America end in abortion? You might see some other stat on that stats page that you want to talk about. Or where did this research come from? Or where did you find that information? So feel free to go to that. Because we're in an academic environment and I want you to know the truth about abortion. 37% of African-American conceptions are aborted. How's that for an alarming stat? Black lives matter? Yeah. Pro-life movement agrees. Every life matters. 37%. You already heard me say one in five pregnancies across America end in abortion. And then when you start trying to put that in terms that you get your hands around, how do you, how do you get... Uh, how do you relate to those stats? Well, how about this? Does this help you relate to these stats? Nine million people perished in the Nazi Holocaust, and in America, we're sitting at about 65 million in our Holocaust since 22 January 1973. Perspective. You want more perspective? If you take the current pace of abortion, which is we're at about 850,000 abortions per year, the peak was 1.6 million. The average since 1973 comes out to be about 1.2 million. Now here comes your perspective. In all combat casualties, I'm a retired Air Force guy, in all combat casualties in America, 750,000 Americans lost their lives. This is since the Revolutionary War, folks. 750,000. Remember the, the numbers I gave? And these are all on this page. Our current pace is 850,000. It's the lowest rate of abortion since Roe v. Wade. Why? Because we're educated. Why? Because we believe. Why? We realize this is the greatest atrocity in the history of our country. And we're trying to write an unjust peace. Listen to those words I just used. There is an unjust peace surrounding the issue of abortion. There isn't peace. So to think that there's been more loss of life in one year of abortion than all combat casualties. Let's keep going for perspective. September 11th, if you Google it, you'll see, Anna, that Google will say that we lost 2,997 Americans on September 11th. Okay? I was stationed in Turkey in an American unit, and my duty title was Chem Bio Warfare Defense Officer. So I was a weapons of mass destruction defense officer in an American unit that was closest to Osama bin Laden on 9-11 with that duty title. Imagine what my next year of my life looked like in that part of the country, or that part of the world. So why do I share that? Well, God does a nice job of equipping us for what he asks us to do. So now I lead the largest pro-life team in the world, and, and I'm still a weapons of mass destruction defense officer. There's been more loss of life from the weapon of mass destruction, abortion, than any other weapon of mass destruction in the history of the world. Perspective. So back to September 11th. You're going to Google 2,997 casualties. It's not true. 11 are known, 11 known casualties were pregnant. Anyone been to the memorial at the September 11th memorial in New York City? Yep, so you'll see they'll list the names, Mike, parentheses, and unborn child. But they don't count them. So if you add the 11, the real number of known is 3,007 casualties. 3,007 casualties. If you average out abortion per day since 1973,
that number is over a September 11th of casualty. It'd be somewhere around 3,500. 3,000 to 3,500. Our current pace per day, about 2,300. But we're over a September 11th loss of life to abortion every day. Perspective. Why am I sharing these numbers so that we can relate? Because what you're going to get on a college campus when you start talking about defending life in the womb is, I think you're extreme. I think you're extreme to want to defend life from conception. Really? You think it's extreme? <laughs> and I am going to leave time for some pro-life apologetics and questions. Run a college campus. What's the first step? When does life begin? At conception. Can you back that up scientifically? Yeah, I'm a professional scientist. I have a PhD in nano analytical chemistry. I taught biochemistry at the Air Force Academy for seven years. So I'm speaking on behalf of science. And there's no argument in science, by the way. Even pro-abortion scientists don't argue when life began, just as a side note. People think that, like, yeah, you know, it's people's opinion. They're not really sure. I'm giving a news flash right now. Big banners flying through here with a little, with a plane dragging it across the room right now. Life begins at conception. That's a scientific fact. But I'm going to put together that scientific fact with our Catholic faith in the Newman Center in Lincoln in a devotion I wrote in this devotional that was published by Life Runners. Bernadette put it together. She picked the best 366 out of about 3,000 that we've written over the last 12, 13 years. But this one's January 23rd. When magnified, you can see that the zygote, our first cell at conception, looks like a communion host, the Eucharist, the body of Christ. The cell surrounding corona radiata is like a monstrance, the holding vessel for the Eucharist. The Eucharist doesn't look like Jesus, and the zygote doesn't look like a person. However, the Eucharist is completely Jesus, and your zygote is completely you. Today's challenge, if you can't see your neighbor in the zygote, just wait a few weeks for magnification. If you can't see Jesus in the Eucharist, read John chapter 6, verses 35 to 69 for magnification. Amen? How Catholic was that? And we got a box of these back there if you want to pick up a devotion tonight. So that reality of when life begins to be able to present an argument. Argument's not a bad word. There's such a thing as a good argument. There's such a thing as a holy argument. So, you know, a lot of them are like, oh, don't argue. No, of course we want to argue the truth. We want to do it mercy, with mercy and compassion. Compassion means to suffer with. So this living pro-life with heroic virtue, how can we be part of ending the reality of those numbers I just presented? Well, I shared the 78%. Are you willing to put on a shirt on the first Wednesday of the month in union with all life runners? So our teammates are ages 0.1 to 101. Those are the ages of registered life runners in the world. There's about 18,000 life runners in the world. Half of them wouldn't even think about running for any reason. And 9,000 are willing to run. And that's one of the questions when you register. So if you already know right now and you want to multitask, because Anna has 50 shirts back there, and Anna, are you selling them for 10 bucks or what are you doing? No, they're free. They're free, even better. You've got to love it. So if you're willing to wear the shirt, the way to get a free shirt is you have to show Anna or me a screen on your phone, big screen that says welcome. So you didn't fill the form out if you don't get right, if you don't get a big welcome. That means one of you, the questions wasn't answered right. So you go back. Fix it, resubmit. So if you get a welcome screen and you show Anna, myself, or Bernadette, hey, I got a welcome screen, you pick up a free shirt. So you need a registration and being willing to put it on on the first Wednesday of the month. So we start there. And then we've got this size. So you're like, oh, my little brother or my niece or nephew, right. And then it just keeps going on up. And we got, you know, all sizes up to 5XL. We got Spanish versions. Remember, we're in 41 nations. And I remember when we made this jersey, I said, man, I sure hope that says remember the unborn. Because that looks like it says a whole lot of other stuff. You know, like, 
You know, same with this. I hope that says life runners. <laughs> you know, <laughs> there's a lot of words for life runners. And my Spanish friend said, yes. And, and so one, you know, you're here living pro-life with heroic virtue, but would, would every, are we in agreement? We're in the Newman Center. Are we in agreement that as you become more pro-life, you become more pro-God? As you become more pro-God, you become more pro-life? Is that a fair statement? I think so. Because this is about life and death, good and evil, God and Satan. So it would only make, and isn't it an oxymoron for someone to say, I'm a pro-life atheist? That's just odd to me. You know? Uh, or someone that would, that's for, for abortion to claim that they're pro-life and to make some weird argument. In short, someone who's truly pro-life is pro-God. Recognize the Creator. And, and we have all kinds of theology to back that up in faith, which is why I take a look at the front of the jersey. The front of the jersey is to evangelize. So we're pro-life, but we're also pro-God. And look at the elements of the, of the jersey. Let's just take some scripture. Remember Jesus said, pick up your cross and follow me. Can you slap on a four-ounce t-shirt cross? Yeah. How about the Holy Spirit dove? That Christ gave us the power of the Holy Spirit to do the same stuff he did. Remember what he said? Go forth and do even greater things in my name through the power of the Holy Spirit. You're thinking, is that really in there? That's in there. That's wild to think that the Holy Spirit affords us to do even greater things than our Lord and Savior. Open your mind to that reality, the power of the Holy Spirit. And what did he ask us to do in his name? He asked us to proclaim the kingdom of God, heal the wounded, and deliver people from evil. When's the last time you, Catholic Christians, have laid your hand on somebody that said, hey, I'm wounded, I'm hurt, spiritually or physically. Hey, my shoulder's been really bothering me. Hey, do you, if you want, I could give it a shot. Can I put my hand on your shoulder? When's the last time you took the liberty? Oh, wait a minute, the responsibility. Mind you, Jesus didn't say, hey, if you want. Luke chapter 9, verse 2, he said, go and proclaim the kingdom of God. Heal the wounded. Deliver people from evil. We're to be doing the same things the apostles did. And if you think, wait a minute, they're the bishops. Well, how about the 72? And then how about the 72 that went out and then referenced to all the people that they encountered? They gave the same decree. So again, ask yourself, when's the last time you did what Jesus asked us to do? Hey, can I put my hand on your shoulder? Hey, can I pray, pray for healing? over you. You do a self-inventory, because that's what he asks us to do. And that's the front of the jersey. So the jersey is evangelization. What's Jeremiah 1.5? That God knew us even before we were in our mother's wombs. And Matthew 25.40 said, what you do for the least of my brothers and sisters, you do for me. So we're in good company. If you're in the Newman Center, you're at a pro-life talk, who wants to go to heaven, by the way? I just want to know who's in the room. Are we all in this thing together? I want to know who does, I want to look again. Who wants to go to heaven? I want to see who doesn't want have their hand up. I love it when I look over every once in a while, I'll see someone with like two hands, you know? They're like, I want to go to heaven. And when I'm in a high school gymnasium, it's amazing all the different hand heights. Like you'll get like, yeah, maybe. You know? The St. Augustine's in the room. Not yet. <laughs> Make me holy, Lord, but not yet. And all the different hand heights. So again, who wants to go to heaven? Remember Christ, keep them up. Where's our zeal? Because Scripture says that if we're living it right, one, we should be like aliens, and two, Scripture says that we should be zealful. So if we want to have Christ work in us, if we want the, keep your hands up, if we want the power of the Holy Spirit to live in us, one of the requirements, so you got to have compassion, humility, but one is that you need to be zealfully open to the Spirit. So just like, you keep that hand up. 
Just like I asked, when's the last time you laid your hand, just like the apostles did, hey, can I put my hand here at your knee? Let me try. I mean, it's, and if you're thinking, do people really do this? And keep that hand up. And I want you to kind of feel it in the shoulder. I'm going to go somewhere with that. Like, hey, my shoulder. And if you need to, you can use your other hand, yeah, like that, to hold up. But keep it going. Would you believe that we really, at an eighth grade confirmation class in Sioux City, Bernadette and I, because Bernadette egged me on, like, Pat, that, that girl over there, look at, she's on crutches. Eighth grade girl that came in on crutches, all wrapped up. I said, hey, you guys want to give it a try? Would it be okay if we laid hands on you? Her classmates, myself, Bernadette, we prayed over her. She ran laps around the gym. Watched it. Keep your hand up. Now, the reason why I'm giving you the opportunity, one, to, to bear witness, wear that jersey, but two, you can feel it by now, right? I watched an episode of Survivor last night. And anyone Survivor fans, you can use your other hand if you're a Survivor fan. Yeah. It, it was the hold the bags above the head. Who's seen the movie Unbroken? Got, yep, okay, yep, the other hand. So you got two hands. Do you remember the scene with holding above the head for his life? Think about that. Keep your hand up. And is this significant in our faith? Sure it is. Does everyone remember the, remember the story in the, in the Old Testament with Moses? Yeah, what happened when his hand came down? Do you remember the story? What happened when Moses' hands started coming down? They started losing. So what, and he realized that. Well, so what was the solution? He got a couple of friends to do what? Help hold his hands up. So if your friend's struggling, and this is the same with the Survivor episode last night, friends were helping each other, hold the be like, here, get here, I'll take this one. Help your friend. Why? Because we're a community of faith. Have people been healed because of a community of faith, Mike? Yeah, how about that paralytic that was laid through the roof? The way that, if you heard a good homily on that, the way that's told it, it was the faith of his friends that lowered him down, right? Intercessory prayer, anyone believe in that? You can use that other hand again. So right now, you feel your shoulder. How Catholic is it for me to say right now, offer it up? Yeah. We're at the Newman Center. We're preaching Christ crucified. And right now, Anna, the Lord can see us raising our hand, being willing to be uncomfortable for the least of our brothers and sisters. Matthew 25, 40. And who do we do this for? And when we do it for the least of our brothers and sisters, we do it for our Lord, for Jesus. And we're feeling it right now. So if you're willing to do this, are you willing to put on a four-ounce shirt and walk across the campus and go to class? You can put your hand down. So that, yeah, I love it. Yeah, keep, I'm going to keep it up. It's like the movie Unbroken. It's the last one. So you get it. That little bit of sacrifice, a little bit of, hey, right. You know, I always get a kick out of it when you have First Wednesday and they, you get the chapter photo because we encourage, like Anna, my recommendation as we start rallying people here is that, you, people are going to get signed up. Remember, I told you if you want to have a head start so you're all ready, you can multitask. No, if you're like, yeah, I'm going to get a free shirt, I'm going to wear it, you can do that now because you're going to need that to get your shirt at the end of the evening. And if you want to multitask, no, no problem multitasking. But Anna, what I recommend is to set a time once or twice on the first Wednesday of the month for a picture. Maybe it's at an iconic spot on the campus. You come up with what you think which might be a good time where people could make it with their schedules. Maybe it's before class starts. Maybe it's over the lunch hour. You get it. You think about where could you get the most life runners. Take a picture somewhere. Iconic on the campus. And I always get a kick out of it on a nice day when a student has their life runner shirt like they've got a hoodie on. And I'm always like, well, that defeats the purpose. You got a Cornhusker hoodie, and you're like, yeah, and you can see a little bit of life runners. I mean, awesome you put your shirt on, but you get my point. The point is, wear your witness. Step outside your dorm room, step outside your apartment, walk out, and just like the title of the talk tonight, living pro-life with heroic virtue, that really, sitting in a math class with this shirt for real, could, probably will over the course of four years, you wearing it, you probably will save a life and spare a mother a lifetime of pain from abortion. Think about it. 
Let that motivate your witness. So that's Life Runners. So now I said I'd talk a little bit about Dobbs and Texas and the pro-life landscape, and then I want to open it up to lots of really hard questions. Hardest questions you got. Be vulnerable. What does vulnerable mean? To show one's wounds. If you got some doubt, some question, ask hard, like, how am I supposed to answer this? What would you say? What do you think of this? Ask the hard questions. So Dobbs, who's familiar with the Supreme Court case that's going to start on Wednesday? Is anyone familiar, seen it in the news, a little bit of, yeah, some little hands? So here's the scoop. Mississippi, state of Mississippi in 2018, passed a law to outlaw abortions after 15 weeks. Now you might think, well, what's the problem with that? I'm going to give you a little pro-life history lesson. The last major pro-life decision was Casey versus Planned Parenthood in 1992. So remember, Roe v. Wade was 1973. So almost 20 years after Roe v. Wade, Casey versus Planned Parenthood basically etched in law the following clarification of Roe v. Wade. That after the point of word Thank you, Bernadette. It was on the tip of my tongue. Viability. That a child could live outside the womb. The state has an interest where they can limit abortion. So that line, 24 weeks. 26 weeks. The last trimester. So technically, you'll hear last trimester, which will put it at 26 weeks. But when you look at it, viability, 24 weeks. And before that, 24 weeks, Casey versus Planned Parenthood in 1992 said, uh-uh, states can't limit. Well, guess what states have done? They whittled at that, whittled at that. And Mike, you can fact check this, but Nebraska, if I'm not mistaken, was the first state to limit it to 20 weeks. And I got it, that's right, because Mike is a Nebraska pro-life guy. Me, I've lived in 13 places since graduating from O'Gorman Catholic High School in 1989. I've been in Nebraska for, this is my fourth year. So that's right. So Nebraska is the first state to get it to 20. And kind of did a, like, is the Supreme Court going to tell us we can't do it? And the Supreme Court just said, we're going to let it go. Now, they do surgeries on little babies down to 22 weeks, maybe even 21, I saw an article. But 20, you know, you're, you're pushing the line of viability, a baby living outside the womb. Now, so I had to set that up because now a state saying we're going to allow it, outlaw abortion after 15 weeks, clearly the child cannot survive outside the womb at 15 weeks. Okay? So this is new, everybody. And this case starts on Wednesday. So if the Supreme Court, which sits right now, solidly at five to four pro-life, five pro-life judges to four. You could get a 6-3 depending on the decision, but solidly five to four, so they've got the votes. If they decide to allow Mississippi to uphold, which has been stuck in the court system since 2018, to uphold that law, this is a game changer. Because now the Supreme Court has said that the states can clearly allow legislation that doesn't allow abortion during pre-viability. And once that happens, can everyone see the logic that if 15 weeks, the baby's not viable, what's wrong with 12 weeks? How about 10? Baby's not viable, still a baby, still life. We already made that case. Life begins at conception, scientific fact. How about Seven weeks. Oh, let's get to Texas right now. Texas. Children aren't being aborted after six weeks. Now, you might be like, time out, right, Mike? But they can't do that. Like, why didn't the Supreme Court say, uh-uh, it's a viability thing. Listen to how Texas, and then you're going to be all caught up with current pro-life legislation across our nation is they wrote their law as follows. Tell me how sly is a serpent simple of the dove this is. They said, we're going to allow people to sue people up to $10,000 for 
aiding in any way aborting children after six weeks. So they never said abortion isn't allowed after six weeks. They just said we're going to allow people to sue. Anyone driving a woman in, an abortionist, uh, an escort at the clinic, anyone that aids in the killing of children after six weeks, the state of Texas said we're going to allow, you, allow anyone to sue for up to 10 grand. And there's been cases. They have submitted cases. Has it, have any been successful? I don't know. But what it effectively did is everyone went, what? I don't want to get sued. So instead of going to an abortion facility in Texas, they took their abortions to Colorado or neighboring states. But still, you get it. Now, you might say right now, maybe this isn't coming up in questions at the end. Maybe someone's going to ask a question like this. Pat, does it really matter? I mean, someone could get on an airplane or just drive to a neighboring state. You might think that. So d does, this, does this matter, Pat? Listen to my explanation. Why do you think states pass laws where they had to wait 24 hours after seeing an abortionist? Some states up to 72 hours. Why? What happens in our humanity over the course of time? Anyone want to take a little comment on that? How about in a moment of crisis? A moment of crisis now versus 24 hours from now versus 40 versus 72 hours. What do you think? It changes. Correct. There's an opportunity for someone, remember the 78%, 78% stat? There's a chance for somebody, they said if one person had encouraged them to choose life, or they saw an encouraging sign. So now you've got 24 more hours. 48 more hours, 72. What if you had to drive from, what if you got on an airplane? The pro-life movement says, fantastic. Because that affords them to get out of that moment of crisis. Bernadette and I watch mothers arrive. Mike, you watch mothers arrive to abortion facilities. And they look like the zombie movies. They're... They looked hypnotized. They looked shell-shocked. I'm describing. I mean, they're in crisis. They might not be able to hear things clearly. Not to mention when they leave the abortion facility, even more so as I just described. So this idea of reaching them, even if we had one more minute. How about this for a story? A college couple at Mizzou, University of Missouri, this is relayed to me from a, a pregnancy help center director. Came to her pregnancy help center in Jefferson City, Missouri, from Columbia. Anyone have friends at Missouri? Couple, there you go. Drove down, saw their unborn baby ultrasound, and still decided to drive across the state of Missouri for their abortion appointment. Now usually when you see the ultrasound, 64% up to 90% of mothers that see their unborn baby ultrasound choose life. They see their baby. But listen to it in reverse. 10 to 36 percent, these are the ranges per centers, etc. don't. They see their unborn baby ultrasound and go, I know it's a baby, but I can't do this. I'm going to have to abort this baby. So they drove across the state of Missouri. They're sitting in Overland Park, Kansas at the Planned Parenthood, moments away from an abortion. He, the boyfriend, texts her, I don't want to abort our child. She replied back, I never did want to. What's the message in that? The message is, is that people, remember one person encouraging her, moms, dads, siblings, friends, boyfriends, teachers, nobody is encouraging her to choose life. So, so what can you conclude from that? You can conclude that her boyfriend literally drove across the state of Missouri to Overland Park, Kansas, and never cast his vote. Never said, hey, like, I don't want to abort our child. And to think that that's all he had to do. One, so I'm back to the, why is it a big deal to outlaw abortion in this state, that someone has to drive across the state? More time for someone to encourage them to choose life. So there you are caught up 
on pro-life rally. And is it a big deal? It's a huge deal. If the Supreme Court upholds Dobbs versus Jackson and allows the state of Mississippi to outlaw abortion after 15 weeks, guess what? Mississippi is going to have another law, <laughs> probably already queued up, that says we're going to outlaw abortion, period, in the first moment. And that's a really big deal because we're going to have states that are abortion-free for the first time since 1973. Praise God. I will open it up to your questions. I don't want to take it so long, and then I might do a break, get people, re keep registering so you can get your free shirt. Um, there's a UNL chapter, if you didn't see that on the drop-down menu, and I'll take your questions. And I brought some hard ones if you don't ask